Hi, this is Chef Rick Moonen interviewing from my studio in Las Vegas. The name of my podcast is Ocean Raised. Here's where I get to dive deep into storytelling with the original gangsters of cuisine to find out where they started and what drives them today. Today, I connect with a deep wealth of knowledge, talent, drive, and maybe most important of all, purpose. That is preserving his family's deep Latino legacy through food and encouraging diversity in the kitchen. Aron Sanchez is an award-winning TV chef, personality, author, and philanthropist. He is chef owner of Johnny Sanchez in New Orleans and a judge on Fox's hit culinary competition series, Master Chef and Master Chef Junior. He is a partner creative director of Cochina, the first online content platform dedicated to celebrating Latin lifestyles through its vibrant culinary culture. Aron grew up in the restaurant business and as, as, I, as I mentioned before, passionate about preserving his family's legacy through food and encouraging diversity in the kitchen. Aron has starred in multiple Food Network shows, most notably as judge on Chopped and Chopped Jr. He was the host of Cooking Channel's Emmy-nominated series, Taco Trip, and has appeared on numerous other shows, including Iron Chef and Best Thing I Ever Ate. Additionally, Aron hosted two Spanish-language shows on Fox 5, Three Minutos con Aron and Moto Chefs. A third-generation cookbook author, Aron has written two cookbooks, La Comida del Barrio and Simple Food, Big Flavor. In fall 2019, he published a memoir titled where I came from, where I come from, life lessons from a Latino chef. In October 2020, Aron and his mother, Zarela Martinez, launched their podcast, Cooking in Mexican from A to Z. Aron has won a James Beard Award for Television Studio Program and was recognized by the Hispanic Federation, the Premio Orgullo Award, for being a leader in the Hispanic community. In 2016, Aron founded the Aron Sanchez Scholarship Fund. ASSF, an initiative empowering aspiring chefs from the, the Latin com- community. ASSF provides recipients with full culinary scholarships to schools in New York City and an ongoing mentorship. Aron's love for the arts extends beyond the kitchen. He is a partner in world-renowned tattoo shop and museum, Daredevil Tattoo in New York City. An avid music lover, he enjoys cooking to the sounds of Port- Portugal the Man, Shaky Graves, Alabama Shakes, Tank and the Bangas, Amigos, uh, I'm sorry, Amos Lee, Liana La Havas, and Lenny Kravitz. Because a lot of those I don't know, so I mispronounced them. I apologize. I also happen to know he likes Freddie Fender. He has a son, Yuma, and lives in New Orleans, L.A. Today I have the privilege of talking to a close friend of mine and an amazing man. His career, his drive, and everything about him is just admirable and um, I get to hang with them from time to time. Aron, welcome to um, our podcast today, man. How's it going? Dude, I'm so excited to be with you, brother. Thank you so much for having me. And interested about hearing more of the, the wonderful work that you're doing, uh, preserving our oceans and all the good stuff. So please uh, bring me up to speed on what's happening. Come oh. on, I need to know what's up, man. No, no, this is this podcast is about you. We'll get into that later. That's like the okay. last quarter. You know, that's the last <laughs> fifteen minutes is when we talk about that stuff. Okay, you know, okay. We get to talk about the boring stuff, like where were you born? Yeah. Where, well, where, where we, did you grow up? Tell, I want I want you to give me a story about growing up. Tell me, you're a great storyteller, so this is where I shut up. No, I mean, for me, look, it's it started simple. I come from El Paso, Texas on the border. So Mexican-American upbringing, you know, both my parents, you know, Mexican and, 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 and uh, have that deep in their blood, obviously. So we grew up speaking English and Spanish at home. Mm-hmm. Food was central, you know, like many of the stories of the chefs that you hear from. But, you know, what ended up happening that was transformational for us is that we ended up moving to New York City when we were about six or seven years old. And my mom had an opportunity her own dreams of being a chef mm-hmm. and restaurateur. So when it came along as, as young children to New York City, this very scary place, as you can imagine, in the very early 80s, trying to go uh, be there as a family and support my mom. And, mm-hmm. and, and that's, in essence, how I got to New York initially. And then I ended up being my home till uh, the last six years where I moved and this is now my home but New York is always very special for me and that's where you and I met and, and a bunch of our colleagues and friends and people that we respect so yeah 
Yeah. So let's, let's give me a, a, give me that's that's your resume. What I want to know is what it was like growing up in uh, in Texas. Then I mean, so you you didn't you, didn't, you weren't born in Mexico, but your parents were. So yes. what part of Mexico was your mother and father from exactly? Yeah. So my my, my mom uh, grew up in a cattle ranch uh, in in Sonora, uh, which is right across the Arizona border. Mm-hmm. And my dad is from, uh, you know, his parents are from a little place called Okinaga, which is like it, it sounds. Asian, but it's actually right there on the border of Mexico in the valley. And he uh, was born in a small town called Valentine, Texas, which was okay. 200 people. My dad grew up in the Adobe house and he was the first mm-hmm. Mexican American to get a, a master's like in the fifties and sixties. He was very a progressive guy, very smart. And then moved to El Paso, which was like the big city back then. Sure. And that's, mm-hmm. that's where he started to form a family and, and do his thing. So, yeah, so yeah, that's kind of where my family's from. So, what was El Paso like? Though? I mean, you're, so you're kid, you got, you're on the backyard hunting lizards. What were you doing as a kid? Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you know what? It looks very similar to where you live, brother. I mean, it's it's very arid and, and and it's desert and all that. And so, when we were kids, you know, we would go and we would swim because it was so hot there in the summertime. And then on the weekends, we go to Juarez. And my dad would wake up early on Saturday. My dad never got up late. He was up at 5.30 every morning getting coffee going. He was one of those kind of men. Yeah, yeah. And um, so then we would go early in the morning on Saturdays and we'd drive to Juarez across the border. And then he, we'd get the best pan dulce. So the best sweet bread, those little sort of uh, very elaborate, ornate little breads. And we'd, yeah, yeah. Have, the, we'd have the whole day in, in, in Juarez and we'd go shopping. And that's what typically a lot of people did on the border is you go to Mexico to shop. Mm-hmm. All Saturday goes, and then you come back home, and so I have a lot of vivid memories of that. And then, um, yeah, man, it was it was neat. It was it's a weird place. You know what I mean, it's like where uh, people are involved, kind of nefarious stuff, and a lot of people are in law enforcement, and a lot of other people are in mm-hmm. education. And you know what I mean? It's just like this place where everybody coexists, and it's yeah. it's really neat for that reason. I love it, man. So yeah, did man. You, did you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My dad had a, a family prior to us, uh, um, so he has three kids uh, from his first marriage. And mm-hmm. my mom married him. He's a he was my dad was a widower. Sadly, his first wife passed away. Oh. Miss Young. So he, you know, so my mom kind of took in these three children, and then had me and my twin brother, who was a lawyer in New York City, who's still there um, practicing in Staten Island. And so yeah, so we're 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 extended family, big family, but not. Not as large as you would maybe think, you know. Okay, so the way you, the way I heard you is that it, like food was a real big part of your your family, your household, in, in you know El Paso, Texas. And uh, so, when did you start to take an interest in doing it yourself? It's a good question. You know, I always knew that I can work hard. I was, I, I knew that. Um, I didn't mind spend, standing on my feet all the time. I knew I, I didn't mind working hard and being part of a team. And I just didn't know how to focus that energy because I played basketball in high school. I was really good, actually, believe it or not. <laughs> tall, for, tall for a Mexican. Anyway, <laughs> so so uh, so I'm like, I was like, man, you know, so I always I liked the idea of like team sports. I thought it was really neat to be part of something. And then like, you know, you go into a kitchen and it's like, it's the ultimate team, you know? So I was like, oh, all right. So this is, I, didn't, I can do this. And then my dad sadly passed away when I was 13. And then, so I, I started reacting poorly. Imagine being in New York City, getting involved, you know, with pot and cutting school and, sure. and, and just not, not, not doing the right thing. And mm-hmm. my mom said to Paul Prudhomme, the great chef, Paul Prudhomme, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I need you to help me with this boy. I need some intervention. And then I went to Louisiana at 16. Yes. Uh, 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 yeah, as an intervention chef, sort of whole thing and that's yeah that Paul it, it was, yeah it was my salvation kind of thing <laughs> that's amazing so let's talk about your mom for a second you know because yep. just for the people that are listening in on this podcast you know for me your mother zarela martinez mm-hmm. she opened up her restaurant what was the name of the restaurant Zarellas. Zarellas. yeah Zarellas. her first name in 87 and right. 87 in 87. In 87 and it was near the 59th street bridge yeah. No, no, no. That's Rosa Mexicano. No, that's that, that. That's our. That's our uh, competitor. Okay, we sorry. were. We were in Fiftieth and Second Avenue across the street. That's uh, right. Around the corner from Lutes. That's we right. We were around the corner that's from Lutes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The Leopard Club was there too. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Right near. Right yep. next to Lutes. And there was another place. Uh, some. Some little something. 
some something with the name Box in it across the street, like yep. something Box. It was like a little, yeah. there's a lot of really cool, you know, places to go in that time, man. It was um, really a cool uh, neighborhood. But you know what's very interesting that because you talk about a very inspiring time of of of, of our of our industry in the early '80s, it was the yeah. birthplace of a, of, a, of a revolution of food, and you know it better than anybody, Rick. You were there, but all the French all the Frenchies came over. Yeah. The birthplace of Nouvelle Cuisine, Michel Richard, Daniel Boulou, Jean Louis Panadan, all of them came over in the early '80s, and it started changing things. And then at the same time, American regional food was born. Mm -hmm. So you have your Alice Waters, you have your Paul Prudhomme, yep. you have your Mark Millers. Jonathan Waxman. Jonathan Waxman. So you have all these chefs that are actually claiming regions of the United States as their own culinary identity. Mm -hmm. And my mom, my mom, you know what I mean? So Jasper White. Jasper White. Yeah. Jasper Dean, White. Dean Ferring down in, in Texas. Te Texas. Uh, yeah. Robert Del Grande. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then you think about all Florida boys. Alan uh -huh. Susser. Yeah. Norman Van Aken. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've done podcasts with all of them. All yeah, of them. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you you know, uh, those are all uh, heroes of mine, you know, and, mm -hmm. and people that I, you know, they were the generation of chefs right above me. And yeah. I and I uh, admired them so much that I was coming up. Oh, man. I have you all their books. Yeah, all me their too. books. I don't have any of yours. We have to talk about that. So. That's all, it's all good. <laughs> I got, they're fun. They're, they're, they're good. They're, it's a good cook. <laughs> yeah, <They're> delicious. You know, <laughs> I just I love you, man. So anyway, we're, I was talking about your mom and mm -hmm. Zorella and Mexican cuisine. You know, it was always Mexican food. You know, no matter what. You know, it was like Chinese food, Mexican food, Italian food. And then Tony May came in, and he started to say, no, 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 no. There's Italian cuisine. There's regions. There's etc. He pushed that. Mm -hmm. your mother was a part of the revolution to push. Mm -hmm. Mexican cuisine and to and, and to emphasize the importance of it because we were no one was really taking uh, Latino cuisine very seriously in, in, when I was growing up yeah, I grew up in a, in a big melting pot you know in Flushing Queens but it wasn't a real uh, strong Latino presence mm. so your mother really to me in my career in my life in my experience because I didn't I didn't see it growing up in my neighborhood I mean, now I'm involved in the food industry. I'm in Manhattan, the city, we used to call it. And I go to your mother's restaurant and I experience for the first time what I consider Mexican cuisine. So yeah. I want, and, I, and she has, and we've done events together. I remember being in. Uh, oh my God, she loves, she loves you, Rick. She loves you. She Gracie loves Mansion. I remember her with a hibiscus behind her ear. Yeah, serving yeah. serving yeah, some yeah. sort of a red tea, you know, from yeah. the hibiscus flower. And my, and my mom always goes, she goes, where's that handsome chef with the glasses that I always like? The one that cooks the great, <laughs> the one that cooks the great seafood. The one that always does it over. I'm all, it's Eric Repair or Rick Mooney? She goes, no, I know Eric. I like Rick Mooney. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's, like, why, <laughs> that's, like, why <laughs> that's why. That's why. Oh my gosh. That's no, why no, I wanted to give her a little bit of homage because she's <laughs> she's something very special. So, go on because now you're um you did you work with your mom in her restaurant yeah, at all? Yeah, I, but I you were but what? you were cutting up to a little bit too much for her, so she sent you down to Paul Prude home to to oh wrestle you right. down to the ground and, and knock some sense into your knucklehead. Absolutely. How'd that work out? How'd, I mean, seriously, tell me your, your experience with Paul Prudhomme. I mean, for those who don't know who Paul Prudhomme is, he's a, he's the Cajun king, you know? I mean, he's the one that made Cajun cuisine um, a popular in, in, in all over the world, I would imagine. But I'm certainly in the United States. New York was very much an influence by his, you know, you knew him in his wheelchair. He's a huge, robust man, mm -hmm. smiling with his Cajun seasoning mix, his pan black and redfish. He wiped out a species, as I know, because you know about sustainability. <laughs> Everybody had to start buying red drum and all other kind of fish just so that you can put those seasonings on and pan sear it. So that's Paul Prudhomme, who I love dearly, who got caught at the airport trying to smuggle a gun into the through the security system. Yep. Here's, this is a character in our lives, and he lost a ton of weight, became yep. this, this this skinny man. So when you went down there, what what part of his life was he in? Because he's going to straighten you out, and that's what makes me kind of chuckle. I just wanted to kind of lay down the. Down, oh down the whole picture. And your mom believes this is the right thing for Ron, her, yeah. her, one of her twin sons. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. 
Exactly. So the, the fact that I'm even saying this now because I live here, when you want to have a kid that doesn't want to drink or smoke pot, what do you do? You send them to New Orleans, right? Yeah, good Probably idea. Not, yeah, but yeah, got great idea, right? But it wasn't like that for me. It was more about I came down here and I was like, all right. He said to me very simply, he picked me up from the airport. He goes, look, I'm going to send you some rules, right? You're staying in my house. You get up when I get up. I'm going to tell you what it is. We're going to go to work every day. We come home. You can have some free time, and that's it, okay? And I'm going to tell you how it is. And I'm like, okay. And I remember, you know, I asked him one day, because, you know, you have to understand the context of this man. He was the most famous chef in America. 100%. I mean, without a doubt. And he would go, we would do book signings at the Javits Center, mm -hmm. and there'd be a 1,000 people waiting to Sign, sign his cookbook. I mean, I, I can tell you stories of me and I was his lackey. Like I was right next to him, like helping him like put the books up. And so he was <laughs> monumental without the advent of television, by the way. I mean, he, yeah, yeah. yes, he did some PBS, but it wasn't like how it is now. So it was cookbooks, personality. How did we, how did we know about Paul then in the 80s? How the heck Wait, did we know that? Because because Craig Claiborne was his big fan of his, yeah, who wrote yeah, New for the New York Times. Times and wrote a bunch of articles about him. It was, yeah. uh, he was very much publicized in a lot of big magazines. Yeah, his, it was always about it was it was the New York Times, it was yeah. a New uh, New York Magazine. Mm -hmm. The Post eh, wasn't all that important. It was the Times, the New York yeah. Times. You feared, the, you know the uh, the food critic of the New York Times. You knew uh, Florence Fabricant, you know, you yep. had the cow cow. Yes, ma'am. She was yep. tough on everybody. She was big names. You know, and that's how what we lived for then. That's how Rubenstein, you yeah. know, I mean, all the guys from, you know, the New York Magazine. Gourmet you know, Magazine. Had a, had Gourmet a as well. Yeah. We, you know, and we were sitting there like thinking, wow, we're, I'm, we're trying to do it in a way that we're playing our cuisine and all this. It was, it, it was tough. Anyway, but Chef Paul, taught me a lot of valuable lessons, Rick. So I was very happy to have me in my life, yeah. you know? And I'm gonna tell you something really quickly that I think is gonna be very poignant for the listeners. Cause you know, he came up with these magics, right? He has these seasonings, right? Yep. So, and I was like, why did you come up with the seasoning chef? And he said to me one time, he goes, look, I'm gonna take you to Opelousas where I'm from and I'm gonna show you how it is. And we went out there and it was a Sunday and after church, we all, they, they put this huge table out in front of their front house and we all ate at, on the Sunday. And then we took a little walk and he says, you see that chicken over there, boy? He used to call me boy, he goes, you see that over there, boy? He goes, that's truly free range. I go, how, how is that, chef? He goes, because it's eating the sassafras, baby. That's dried up, it's eating the lemon peel from over here, you see what that? So that chicken tastes like something. And he goes, now with mass produced uh, pro uh, poultry and fish for that matter, um, it doesn't taste like anything. So he's like, so I had to reintroduce nature back into the product. So his seasonings had all those flavors and those sensations that he grew up with and right. put him in a bottle. Isn't that neat? Bottle you know what I mean? Bottle. Yeah, baby. So it was really neat. And I was like, wow, till this year, you know, you know, all those years later, I'm still remembering it. When are you gonna come up with your spice mixes, man? Arons, uh, adobo. Uh, I have one of those. I have some of those already. I, yeah. I figured out what I like. You know, I, I, I've realized throughout all my trials, I, I don't like cumin at all. You don't? Um, what? Hold on. No, no, no. Why? Does it taste like pencils? No. Yeah. It's, no, it's it just tastes like my, a pencil to me. Yes. It the just. Pencil season sharpenings or something. It's overused. Cinnamon. <laughs> and, and canela. I know you can that we disagree disagree but i'm just no, saying cumin okay. is a very, it's a very aggressive flavor i do disagree i love cumin it's it <laughs> cumin is necessary no you're pulling out a member of the orchestra man saying you know i don't like the trumpet out you know you can't <laughs> you, know, you can you can always mute the trumpet you know you can put your hand on it a little bit but it's, you gotta have a little trumpet in there you know what i'm saying i do I, I i do like cuban you're right i mean but but because it eats Yes, wait, wait. is like you're breaking sorry. Up. You're breaking up. On no, it, it 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 just a little. Are you there? I'm here, but you're freezing up on me. It's all right. Whatever. Just as long as you can hear me. I can hear. Yeah. You. So no. So it just because cumin is so overused in Mexican food unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. In Mexican cuisine, you use cumin for beans, 
it's really like one of the only few real traditional applications, but everyone puts cumin and all these sauces in Mexican cuisine and it tends to be the only prevalent flavor. So that's yeah. the only reason I have a little bit of a, a dis. You have yeah. an adversity towards uh, yeah, the yeah. overuse but, of cumin. Yes. Right. So, so now we agree. I do too. I mean, <laughs> even in, even in my uh, chili, you know, which is, yeah. I don't know, it's from uh, Texas, I think originally. I forget what part is it. San Antonio started mm -hmm. chili, supposedly. I don't know. Yeah. But so, you know, the, the amount of cumin in that can be like, it's, it's all you taste. Okay. So, can, so go ahead. No, no, just real quick, because you just brought up chili. So a, what is the, the original chili? What does it, what does it, what does it, does not, what does it do have and what does it does not have? All right. Original chili. I'm going to guess. This is my guess because, you know, I didn't study for this test. Thanks a lot. Put me on the spot. Um, I'm going to, it's going to have beef. Yes. It's going to be cho hand chopped. It's not going to be ground yes. up beef. Yes. Hand chopped. It's not, it's not right. Chunks of beef, not little. It's really a stew, right? Mostly. Yes. It's, yeah. it's, now I'm going to guess that it did have a little bit of tomato in it. Yes. Am I right? Okay. Uh, and, I, and I know it had cumin and chili, lots of chili powder. I mean, that's important. But right. no what? No beans. No, it's no beans, exactly. No beans, no, no, no beans. beans. So, so the cumin in there, now according to you, the, the word of Aron Sanchez is that cumin is only used with beans. So cumin doesn't belong in the original chili. Now, does it according to well, I mean, logic? No, you can. It, you look, here's the deal. Some, the, the original chili doesn't have tomato, but I'm going to give you that one. It's just okay. really chili powder, mm -hmm. and it's it, and it's it's thickened with the flour roux. And that's oh, really? Roux? Yes. Yeah, wow. And then start doing masa, you know, masa roux and stuff okay. to kind of just, yeah, to yeah, give yeah. it some body. Sure. But, but um, yeah. Yeah. That, that that's the deal but cumin is is totally totally uh, admissible in that situation so how about oregano oregano is always in that always, always always but it's always mexican. right isn't it mexican isn't it? oregano mexican oregano 100 percent mexican that's all i use it's the only oregano that tastes like oregano to me i yeah. grow it in my own yard it's like eh, i dry it out and i use it a lot you know i'll mm -hmm. put it i make an italian blend big jar of it. it's just everything i put marjoram and oregano and you know thyme and in it, and all, everything in a big jar and it's my mix so whenever i want to have that flavor i know what it is but i always in every recipe i do recipe development now for a big company and it's in every one of the kitchens the only oregano in the kitchens now is mexican it's, <laughs> no i get it you know and, and even even uh is it vanilla right this part yeah. is, is vanilla come from mexico as well yes mm -hmm. okay so i'm gonna break a lot of hearts right now so there's tahitian right that everyone yeah. knows and madagascar mm -hmm. But if you want to go to have the best vanilla you've ever had in your life in Pampatla, Veracruz, up in up in the north, it's beautiful. They make some of the most delicious vanilla you've ever had in your life. Yeah. And, and it's, I, mean, I want to say, I, I don't know what it is now, but half the price of the Tahitian and the Madagascar This is like style. Bitcoin, man. I mean, you know, like yeah. vanilla is like, get your, get your vanilla pods. I've, I've got about 150 <laughs> vanilla pods stuffed in a jar in my, in my pantry figure, and someday I can cash in on that stuff. <laughs> That's your retirement, okay? Right yeah, there. man. You'll hey, be you like know. a vanilla a merchant, a vanilla merchant. I love it's, it. It's not easy, you know. I just do podcasting. What do you want from me? You know? <laughs> you uh, imagine? That'd be the uh, best. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Okay. Well, like, okay. So let's go back to the city for a minute. So you're, yeah. you're uh, what, what, what's the first restaurant you worked in, other than your mother's? Um, the and first Paul restaurant. Paul Fruit Homes. I mean, okay. So now, so now you're in New Orleans. So yeah. uh, you get together with. Uh, yeah. So I come up there. I go to New Orleans. I spend some time, and then come back and start working in restaurants intermittently. I was with my mom during the summers, and then I end up work. Um, I go to I go to Johnson and Wells for one year, by the way, to culinary schools. So shout out to Jay Wu. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was there yeah. for for one year. Um, I had already worked in restaurants, and they were teaching me how to do brunoise and all the simple stuff. And I felt like it was a little bit taking a step backwards, so I left. Yeah, yeah. And then went to I went to work in um, various different restaurants, and then I ended up working with with um, with Douglas Rodriguez at Patria oh, when he man. opened. Now, now that yeah. atmosphere was crazy. Yeah, yeah. That was crazy. And this I remember the cigar, the dessert. Yeah. Remember? yeah. It must have been nice when I came in there as a little, as a young man, like trying to, you know, figure it all out. And did, it you was, work, it was, did, did you work downstairs or upstairs? I worked, no, when I started downstairs always, but then 
because I was a good looking kid, they put me up in, um, right there in front of everybody, you know, making ceviches and everything, you know, but, uh, <laughs> it, it, it was, it was a good, it was, it was transformational. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Chef Douglas was the first guy to teach oh. us about how a Latin food could be elevated. He was the Pantano and, King, man. Yeah. It was a really special time. Um, right on know, Park Avenue, ceviches. Yeah. What was that big jar that you drank something out of it? Oh, like well, eyeballs and stuff in it. What is? It, it explain was, that to me. It's called Mama Juana, and Mama Juana is that's like right. this potion that they make out there in Peru, apparently, and it has like it has the octopus and like a snake head, and it's yeah. like this 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 liquor that's sort of infused with all these spices. Yeah, well, I'm it's, having it, effects. It, I'm having effects from that. Who do I talk to? <laughs> Phil, Phil you, Suarez. <laughs> yeah, you got to hear the story though, dude. You don't, you don't even know this one, man. What? So I was supposed to have um, I was supposed to have an interview with Tom Calicchio next door at Cramercy Tavern. Yeah, yeah, right around the corner. Yeah, yeah, no, next door. Yeah, next. Oh, door. that's right. Yeah, 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 next door to Patria. So then my mom goes, we had Sunday dinner, and I had the interview the next day this with is Tom Gramercy Tavern. Yeah, Gramercy Tavern. We're talking about you know the whole thing, and um. Hold on for, yeah, and, and I was just like, cool, man, let's, let me go over there and have this interview with, with you know, the um, ultimate chef. And then I walk by on the way to Grand Mercy Tavern, and I see Patria. And, the, and my mom had just told me about it yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I walk in, I go, meet the chef. And they're like, who are you? I go, my name's Aaron Sanchez. I'm Sorella Martinez's son. Can I come and work with you? And, the, and Douglas came up. He says, yeah. Can you start right now? I go, yep. And I put an apron, and I never went to see Thomas. Uh, oh, now you're now you're terrific friends with Tom, of course. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but imagine how my career trajectory would have changed had I just named not made that impulsive move right there. That's brilliant. Isn't that, cra isn't that crazy, bro? Like, yeah, how man. life can take you to one direction or the next. You know what I mean? One hundred percent. It's happened to me several times in my career. I've never yeah. used a resume to get a job my whole life, ever. No. No, no. You know, I it mean, it's that. just like someone says, yeah, this guy's great or whatever, you know, and you, or you just do it on your own, you know, sit down with Buzzy O'Keefe for 20 hours before he decides. <laughs> <laughs> Buzzy O'Keefe. Buzzy's not a quick decision maker. He's, 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 he drives you crazy, you know. <laughs> I hear you, baby. I hear you. Oh, man. That was, that was the 80s for me, but that was the late 80s when I was at the water club. So, uh, and who else did you work with in, the, in, in that kitchen? Because I know a lot of people came from the, I know it's Charlie Palmer, right? Charlie Palmer uh, was at the River Cafe. I'm sorry, I'm never Cafe. At the Water Club, who else was the chefs there, though, that you oh, worked with? Not a lot of chefs that you would know. Um, well, Brad Steelman, who's now the chef at the River Cafe, has been for yeah. many, many years and continues to be fantastic. He, uh, he worked for me. He was my sous chef at, uh, at the Water Club in 88. I took him on. Um, I was at Chelsea Central, small little restaurant in Chelsea, got finally reviewed by Brian Miller. Now my name's getting known a little bit, you know, and I'm doing all this stuff. And I, I bring in Tom, um, Tom, uh, what's his name? Dang. Very popular chef. He's got a place called West, O-U-E-S-T, on the west side of Memphis. Oh, Valenti, Tom Valenti. Tom Valenti. Oh, man. So, yeah. all right, so Tom, Tom just got uh, booted out of a restaurant because the owner folded it and said, shut the doors on him. And he's like out of job. I'm looking to leave Chelsea Central that I got reviewed from the New York Times. And now Buzzy O'Keefe finally hired me. So I, uh, I, I, Tom, Tom told me, hey, man, you need some good people. I just had to release a bunch of really great guys that I've been training for a long time. I said, Shh, get your butt over to Chelsea Central now. He would sit down and said, man, this is perfect. I don't want to leave this guy in the lurch, but I haven't told him yet, but I'm splitting but you could just come in with your crew and I can leave with some of the guys I trained and I don't have to feel guilty about the maneuver. You know, there used to be integrity in the industry at some yeah, point, you know, yeah. you know, like they give you, you know, steal people, you call up Hey, Charlie, your guy just interviewed with me. I don't know. You, you're sure, you know, he's, you know, he's looking cause I need, I need a sous chef. And you know, Neil Murphy looks like a great guy, you know, he's like, yeah, <laughs> Neil's, Neil's been with me for 10 years, you know, and he needs to see some different stuff. So yeah, you got my blessing, but I need him for three weeks, you know, because I got this big gig coming up. I need him for, can you wait three weeks? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you do that, you know, so back, yeah. so, so, you know, so we're back and Tom just moved in. I went over Brad Steelman, who was friends with Tom, Don Pintabona that worked for me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know, Donnie. Of guy. course I work with Drew. I work with Drew. Oh, that's right. Damn, you see that? Damn. So and, of course so, I know. And, and Drew's another podcast. I just, he's looking good, man, for you know, yeah, yeah. stroke and heart and having cancer. Man, yeah. Know. So anyway, 
uh, where was I? You just threw me off. No, no, no. We're talking about just the old days. You know what I mean? There's like yeah. how. Yeah, but Brad you know, Seelman's working at the uh, place. Uh, Bellini, they had Bellinis. Uh, they were known for their Bellinis. Uh, anyway, some Texas, Petrosian. Petrosian. Not Petrosian. Petrosian is not Bellini. That's they're they're the. Oh, it doesn't matter. Luchels. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, Luchels. So I got I stole Brad Steelman. Brad Steelman's now at the Road Ruby Cafe. And uh, who else came out of there? I don't know. A lot of everybody went did really great. And that's when I was really standing next to the guys peeling shrimp, jumping on the line, expediting. Yeah. I was in the in the dining room. I was all over the water. It was crazy. <laughs> and then I then I went to uh ninety four. I went to um uh opened up I didn't open up, I went to Oceana. Yeah, of course. That's, that's right. really where. Well, that's where you made your name, right? Come on. Exactly. Everyone, exactly. everyone knows that. So what this? I thought this podcast was about you, man. So what we? No, no, so no, no. But I just, uh, go ahead. I just want to say one thing that in culinary schools we were just there with Emerald, who's a dear friend of ours, and we know, and we were just at the at Johnson and Wales in Providence, mm -hmm. and I think they should make a culinary tree, like they do for coaches, right? So if you work with Bill Walsh, and you all these coaches come from this coaching tree, they should do that for chefs. So the young people know this is all the great chefs that came from these vulnerable chefs. You know what That'd I'm saying? Be, that would be So that, that way the young people know, you know, the influences and all the different mentoring that we received along our way to our career. And it will yeah. give them a perspective and it will give them a lot of, of just insight. Anyway, I'm sorry. No. I think, sorry. I think that's a good thing, man. How long were you at Patria? I was there for two years. Two years, and then, and then, and then I went to uh, San Francisco to work with um, Mark Miller. Mark oh. Miller was, yeah, he was opening up a restaurant called Lumar, which was this Asian fusion thing. And I met a girl who I was madly in love with, and I was like, "All right, I'm gonna move to San Francisco" because she was getting her doctorate at Berkeley, and then it just worked out perfectly. I, I went out there and, and was with her, and then I got to cook at with with Mark Miller and was Mark. Harry. There was he at the restaurant. Yes, and then I work with Reed Herring. So I work with Reed at, at Rose Pistola, yeah. who's a chef that a lot of people don't know about, but he was a San Francisco chef yep. and opened up a really beautiful Italian restaurant called Rose Pistola North Beach in San Francisco, which I worked at. Well known. Yeah, and uh, I cooked there, and then I worked to work with Mark. So, yeah, just getting those experiences under my belt. You know what I mean? You know? Uh, that's it. No, that's it. So who do you consider your mentor? Is there, do you have a mentor? Or is it just yeah, like your, your yeah. whole life combined? No, I, of course I've mentor. You, you're one of my mentors, baby. Oh. You know, and there's nothing better to have a friend that can be your mentor as well. But, um, you know, of course I have many, I have many, many mentors. I have uh, my mom, obviously I have Chef Paul and uh, all the chefs that I just mentioned are all yeah, mentors yeah. to me and, you know, people that, you know, took a, vest, a vested interest in me. And, you know, now because of my scholarship, I'm able to to give that back to the kids that we have in our program. And yeah. that's that that's me joy. I think that's an awesome ambition. And you take these students and you, you know them personally. You, mm -hmm. Aron Sanchez. Is taking not not if this isn't like the you know a busload of, of kids this is these are hand selected they have to show you that this is something they really want to do so you have a selective process go to, to that they have to go through a testing before mm -hmm. they you don't know, just like throw them in the air and whoever catches it's the one that goes to school you know and then you follow through with it which i just think is tremendous it's like extending your family you know through absolutely your, through a charity so i hope everybody listening understands that and 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 then follows her on and, and, and contributes to his charity. She does a lot of stuff. He, he's always there as a friend, you know, for, uh, you know, Emerald Legasse, this is where I get to, you know, it was one of our playgrounds. We get to get on his boat and, and, and raise money for his charity mm -hmm. and raise awareness for your charity. He's, everybody's cool with just doing it, you know, and that's your, that's your life mission, which is in the Latino kids. Yeah. Is, this is, you know, so the DNA is all there for you. That makes sense. So yeah. I want to talk about, is that that fit that in the ocean let's okay. talk about those let's talk about them shall we can we yeah yeah, yeah. Well, i want to hear yeah the sponsor of this program is uh is uh you know is what is it, what is the name of them uh, you know i forgot forever oceans it's, yeah so forever oceans is a startup company aquaculture doing things responsibly and they're focused on flavor texture and nutrition as well and, and historically, you know, as a chef, and I'm sure you, you, you've probably seen this sort of curve. When aquaculture, excuse me. 
I had the cough. So no, it's all good. historically, you know, we were getting fish, you know, and, and I was very much involved in what's going on in the, in the environment. So I'm starting to see aquaculture. I mean, aquaculture, we don't need aquaculture. We just have to take better care of our environment. We got plenty of fish. There's millions of fish in the sea. Well, it turns out people only want to eat certain fish. So that narrows down those fish and we're loving them to death. You know, we're killing them. And so now aquaculture becomes a necessity. I start to see it. I, but the stuff that we were getting really wasn't that interesting. Other than salmon. Salmon was great. That was a chicken. Mm. That was chicken on the menu. Everybody had salmon of some sort on their menu. They were crazy because that's how you made money. Because it was affordable. It was farm-raised. It was great. It was perfect. There were bullets. Bing, bing, bing. You, you can order a certain size and they're always that size because they're farm-raised. It was mm. great. And But other than that, you know, what are you seeing hybrid striped bass you got this barramundi that if you overcook 12 seconds it turns to crap you know and you, it was like all these difficult species that we were first introduced to and you could of course get your catfish and your tilapia as long as it's farm raised in the united states of america that's what i would tell people it's mm. it's a good product because there was just too much people trying to undermine that uh that well-established business you know i mean most people don't realize but if you go in your backyard dig a hole and fill it with your garden hose you can farm raise catfish if you do it mm -hmm. right. you can mm -hmm. you know yeah. and so that's an american thing you know but certain people feed it corn you know they they they, <laughs> they understand the american but then it's mass produced in other countries and they, sh they flooded they flood the market with it they call it a different name because they're not allowed to compete with the catfish council but it's still they get in, they get their stuff in the market people see it and they eat it and that's the whole thing about that so I completely forgot what I was talking about when I went into that story. What was I talking about? No, no, but we're just talking about what Oceans, uh, what oh, okay. Oceans okay. is doing. Yeah, yeah. So right now, so they're, they're coming out with a, a, it's going to be available to the public uh, later this year, probably in the fall. They're farm raising it in Hawaii. Beautiful waters. The temperature's just right for raising amberjack. And they're, they're, they're uh, calling it Kahala. So Kahala mm -hmm. is their own brand, you know, their own, so they can differentiate themselves against others because there's other people with similar but this is the exciting part once they establish you know and then you know there's an infrastructure there's investors there's all these things there's 13 years of knowledge behind the, the the person who's whose dream this is to come to fruition and he's got all these supporters so the kahala has to like reach some sort of reach some, some level of success so that they can start to go into research and and doing things like red snapper the same quality but snapper farm raised interesting mm -hmm. right? and mm -hmm. uh and then grouper these are all go fish obviously you know the yeah, of course as well as yeah anyone, that's about to one. say so that's exciting so you're going to get a couple of kahala sent to you because you know they're not released to the market yet but i want to get your feedback on it you know do a little video if you can to say something uh, but you know i want your honest opinion yeah, yeah, absolutely. First of all, amberjack is one of my favorite fish. I mean, we, we cook a lot of it here in New Orleans. Obviously, they're all goldfish, as you can imagine. And, yep. um, you know, for us, it, you know, after the oil spill in Louisiana, and I say us because this is, this is home, mm -hmm. you know, there was a lot of ambivalence about buying fish from the Gulf, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why, I, you know, a lot of people were concerned that it was tainted or whatever, the whatever, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. sort of that, 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 feet kind of uh, dissipate a little bit, but what you guys are doing at Forever Oceans, I think is the way. It's sustainable, first of all, mm -hmm. and it's actually uh, looking at different water sources around the world, you know, you're talking about Hawaii, that are conducive, you know, to their fish from another native to another area. So I like because it's low impact, it's it's being smart about the future, and I think that's that's that, that that's smart. So you consider me a fan right, right off the, the jump. And um, yeah, amberjack is one of the most beautiful. Or kahala, oh. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, kahala. Excuse me. Yeah. No, it's right. It, it, it is an amberjack. That's the that's the species. You know, yeah, yeah. you call it that, but no one knows amberjack. It goes yeah, yeah. into a hundred. It goes into many different names. But but, but it, it's a very it's a very interesting fish because it's one of the few fish that you can smoke and you can flake mm -hmm. and you can put into a, a a dip, if you will, with with a you know a cream based mayonnaise, you know, and you can grill it so it stands up to a grill. And yeah, you know, yeah. and you can crust it. It's a, it's, it's a really okay, interesting so you, fish. So if you yeah. can do it raw, poached, yeah. seared, grilled, broiled, baked. Yeah. You can do yeah. a whole fish baked. You know, you get a yeah, small yeah. one. It, it, it's got so much natural fat in it. You know, mm -hmm. I, we, I did a blind tasting uh, not too mm -hmm. long ago, where we, and we, I, I got to put my hands on the fish and cook it and cut mm -hmm. it up, and you know, the texture is amazing for me. You know, mm -hmm. I, it's, 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 it's easy to fillet. You got the collar. You, know, mm -hmm. you, cut, you take the head off, you run your knife down the back, take it off. Gorgeous fish, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
it, it's got that versatility, you know. It's, it's, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, getting feedback and, you know, and see what, uh, you know, when it finally hits the market where it goes. Cause, you know. and, we, and we'd be very interesting to have it because, you know, right now, like you said earlier, you know, we, we have to be more conscious as, as ever as chefs and people that are decision makers in the mm-hmm. market yep. about what we're purchasing because, you know, if I, if, like, for instance, if I post something on my Instagram or my restaurant's Instagram about a fish and it's not – and it's in danger, then mm-hmm. I'm doing a disservice. Right. So I have, we have to educate ourselves on yeah. what we're putting out there and that information we're disseminating because that's really important. Well, I just want to exploit all your mm-hmm. fans. That's all. Yeah. The only reason I'm friends, <laughs> it's the only reason I'm friends with you, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Shit, man. We were friends before all this. Don't worry about it, buddy. <laughs> so <laughs> tell me, okay, I want to know about the paint, man. What's up with the paint? I want to hear the story of Ron Sanchez and... Is uh, the, the, the love affair with the tattoo. You know what it was? You know, I've always been somebody that's always uh, gone against the grain. I'm yeah. not somebody that wants to be told what to do. My mom told me when I was young, she goes, you're the kind of person that doesn't want a boss. I go, yep. <laughs> and then in Mexico, they call it a manzado, like I'm unseasoned. Like uh, when you have a horse <laughs> that won't, you won't put the saddle on, but it's a good horse. Right. Yeah. That, that's me. That's me. You know, <laughs> or you have like a moral and pestle that, you know, you have to like, you know, yeah. you have to cure. Like that's me. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like you have to like cure it and you have to calm it down. You know what I mean? So that's always been my thing. And so then, you know, like the damn tattoos kind of fit into that. Cause I was just always like against, I just want people to uh, know me for as a person. Yeah. And now it's almost cliche have to have tattoos. You know now, I mean? like when, you know, when I started doing it 22 years ago, shit, no one got tattooed back then. It was bikers, yeah. drug dealers in New York City that got tattooed. Now Murder, it's like murderers, yeah. people like yeah. murdered a few people, a couple of tears and, here. And and then now you see chefs with a damn uh, like a little like a beat bushel. I'm like, yo, beats too. <laughs> but, but like that that doesn't make you cook better though i just want to throw i want to throw that out there buddy okay you know what i mean and i, I like asparagus <laughs> we go through these trends though you know every bartender had to have a handlebar you know yeah, yeah. if you didn't have so, facial hair as a, as a mixologist no one took you seriously you know what i'm saying it's just <laughs> one of those things <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting, you know, our industry, I think, is, is grown up a lot and I think is in a very tumultuous uh, position right now because what we need to do is make sure that people are getting into our industry for the right reasons, not to be on television like me, right. not to be on television like Gordon or anything. You have to come into this because you want it and you're passionate about it. I do that all that other stuff as, as, as a, a supplementary piece. Because you can. The, yeah, and at, yeah, every day I'm a cook. That goes away. I have these right here, baby. I have my hands, and I will right support on. my family. My family will never go hungry. You know. Can I ask you a, a, a question about Mexican food? Because I have um, recently purchased a lamb. I'm, I'm you know, sheep. You was a female. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, it was 150 pounds. It was, you know, it was brought up in 4H. You know, it's a 4H. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. show deer. Beautiful. Deer, not deer. Lamb. Yeah. And so my friend said, Hey man, it's 150 pounds, 250 bucks. I'm like, I'm all in, but I want to, I want to pay for it. And I want to process it from the very beginning mm-hmm. to the very end. And so I mm-hmm. did, it was an amazing experience for me, you know, because I didn't grow up on a farm. You know, I did, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm from a city more or less, you know, I was in Lansing, Michigan. I lived for a while, blah, blah, blah. There was a farm across the street and I ate everything. I was growing. It was warm off the vines, blah, blah, blah. Great story. But back to the sheep, this lamb. So um, I have a bunch of it, you know, and I and I and I, I broke it down into primal parts. I took the neck neck meat and I made merguez out of it. I mm. took the shoulders and and the, and the shanks and I braised them and I made a beautiful uh, Irish stew in March, you know. Mm. So now I got a saddle, <clears throat> I got the rack, but I cut the rack short. I cut the bones short because why are those? They're only show these long bones. So I when I when I was taking off the the ribs. I saw it through a little hot closer to the to the, the muscle. I only want the muscle of the rack. So mm-hmm. if it's got a little tiny bone, that's what it's got. Anyway, so I, I took that uh, those ribs and I cooked them. You know, I just you know rubbed them down with my dry rub and then I just mm-hmm. caramelized them real slow for over two hours. It took to caramelize them and I wrapped them in uh, aluminum foil. Cooked them another two hours. 
Amazing, huh? No, the fat, it, it was crunchy. It was thick, the fat. It was, it, was a, it was a healthy animal. But I looked in it, you know, I knew what it ate. I saw the alfalfa, you know, when I was mm -hmm. butchering it. And it, it it, it, it got me so much closer. So, to my question to you, sorry, I got a light. I just oh, shake no, 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 no. So I've got, oh, I got the legs, I got the saddle, I got the the rack. It's all in deep freeze. I want to. What do you do? You know how to make barbacoa, lamb barbacoa? Absolutely, absolutely. Of course, I, wanna I know. Do, how to I want to do it with you, man. Okay, well, well that's my dream. I want to want you to come to my house, and you're gonna have to stay a couple of days, maybe. Oops, what a problem that might be. Um, and you know, because I know it's got to be marinated. It might be a couple of, how long, what is the well, process? Tell me, cause I want to well, well, it depends on what style of barbacoa we're going to go after. But the one that I think we should do, which I think would make the most sense, which is one of my favorites, uh, it's kind of like a little bit more of a, you know, they do it all over, but the one that I had that I really liked was in a little place called Tepeji del Rio, which is about two hours outside of Mexico city. And basically okay. what we do is they marinate, you know, the you or, you know, the lamb, uh, overnight. <clears throat> And then what they do, which is very interesting, is that they build a pit, right? Or yep. uh, yeah, I'll do know. it. I'll do it. Yeah. 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 And so back in the you know, they, they would, you know, uh, you know, they, I would imagine they would use hot stones or whatever. Is that and a pibil? Yeah, it's kind of a pibil, but that's Yucatan. But this is more just like an open pit with mm -hmm. very low cooking embers. Uh -huh. And then what you would do is you know, you're going to go and then you're going to wrap this 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 lamb or, or or mutton, whatever you have, depending on the age. And then you're going to wrap it in pencas, which are the actual leaves of the agave. So the how, how do I how do you, is that something you can get in the Mexican market? Yeah, yeah, pen, asking for pencas. They don't know what that means. And then no, we wrap, have great markets in Las Vegas. So. Yeah, and then you wrap. It, it, you know, when it comes time to cook, you marinate, and you can wrap them in the pencas. Some people don't. Some people do. Uh, I'd like to because I think the acid of the of the cactus kind of tenderizes the meat. That's mm -hmm. just me. Some yeah, people yeah. like it different. Uh, and then you wrap it, and then you, you know, you, then you put it over in essence uh, a grate as mm -hmm. it slow cooks overnight, mm -hmm. and then all the juice falls into a pot of garbanzo beans and, and shaved cabbage and sometimes oh, carrots yeah. and onion, and then you have the consomme, so you have the broth of just this most essence natural juice you've ever mm -hmm. had i'm just an animal i gotta and do this with, with this lamb you do this with me we'll taste this lamb you go yeah, crazy yeah, yeah, yeah. and i want to go to the market there's great markets here but you know i walk in and mm -hmm. I, I know what i want so i want to walk the aisles with you and you tell me about it i mean yeah, serious would yeah. you do that i mean huh? yeah of course and there's many different styles by the way i don't want to be like the barbacoa expert there's people that just do this yeah. but i'm going to tell you you can have it just a broth by itself without the garbanzo beans without the cabbage this is all regional you yeah. know what i mean but it definitely has to be marinated and it just has to be wrapped in pencas or agave or cactus and then slow roll and so, then the juices fall down so i would probably use the legs for that right we'd probably yeah place yeah, yeah. up the legs yeah you, that you, yeah that probably has the right fat meat ratio. Well, if you had it on the bone, baby. It's on the bone. Okay, well, you don't have to dice nothing. Just put it on the damn bone. It's just like the whole thing. And then we just shred it later, baby. Come on. All right. All right. I know. Okay. You know what I mean? All right. You let me know when you want to do that. It's crazy. Oh, no, I want to. It's a lot of fun, too. And the meat, it's like the best ever. Ugh. And then they have something called barbacoa tatemado, which is where, the, you know, a lot of people just will shred the meat without any texture. But right. there's certain places, in, 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 especially in Jalisco, where you take the meat and then you actually crisp it up oh, on yeah. the outside, on the oh, griddle. Yeah. Yeah, so okay. you have like this slow roasted meat, but then you just sear the outside really quickly. And then, it, and then you can brush it with like a little chili, the, mar the same marinade, and it's delicious. I'm all in. I'm all in. All right, so baby. I, I just want to ask you one quick question. If if you sure. didn't become a chef, if you didn't, you know, become the personality that you are, the giving real, you're so real. That's the thing that's so wonderful about you. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's you don't hold back anything, and that person is wonderful. No, the, you're a, oh, a soft, you. kind, wonderful, sweet man. You know, mm -hmm. I want everybody to hear that loud and clear because that's the way Thank I feel you. about you. So if you didn't become a chef, well, but like. What what what, what, do you, what direction do you think you would be if if you could have if you wanted to? Is there a hey you know, I could have done this if I wanted to. I mean, you talked about basketball as a kid. You were really good, you know. But yeah. what what would have been your uh, alternative to a chef? Me cansé rogarle, me cansé de decirle que yo sin ella de pena muero. I would have loved to have been a mariachi singer. Uh, 
T- tight, stretchy pants? Come on, dude. All, <laughs> Would all, you, all did the, you have one of those gigantic guitar thing? What those things are the real big ones? Is that you? Yeah, the, the bajo, the bajo sexto. Yeah. Uh, that, that would, I would have one of those, yeah. Uh, Definitely. And i just come out there and be like, doom, 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 yeah, doom. kick back, work for about two hours, yeah. and go back to the bar. It'd we be awesome. I love that, man. When, when my wife and I would go down to Punta Nita, we'd yeah, go man. to the resort, and the mariachis would come out, and my wife would just... She looked at him and it kind of scared me. She just looked, she was falling in love, man. She just loves, 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 loves that, you know, like the. the oh, it's the, it's the love, baby. We have a beautiful culture. And, you know, I'm so, you know, I'm blessed for everybody in this world. I want everybody to be happy and I want food to be that common denominator, that, that, that language we all speak, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Let's bring people together. Let's be kind to our planet. Let's be kind to other people. You know what I'm saying? And let's, and let's make bring, sure we're doing the right. But let's let's take Mexican cuisine to the next level. I mean, America's mm-hmm. finally embracing it. And thanks to people like you and Rick Bayless, mm-hmm. you know, who really made it popularize it as well in his own way. There's different there's so many regions of Mexico, there's plenty of room for everybody because we all want to learn. I do. You know, and that's why that's why I would love to uh, have you come to my home and and we could hang out and you could show me what you know, you know. But you gotta give me those. You gotta give me those oysters with the plankton. You got it, man. Which is one of the most amazing. Tell people real quick, Rick, before we get off about about what what you served me, bro. Because it was one of the most amazing things. I felt like Aquaman after I had this thing. This is funny. So, uh, marine phytoplankton from uh, La Paz in uh, in Spain. There's there's an area there that that, uh, it's just the most natural. And, and thriving uh, environment for, uh, for actually they, they do a lot of aquaculture there, but they just put the fish in and they don't have to feed them because mm. it, it, there's just, there's enough activity and everything going on in these waters that all they have to do is harvest them later, you mm-hmm. know, and and they lose like twenty percent of their harvest every year to wild birds, but that's part of the, that's part of it. Mm-hmm. They don't mm-hmm. care. They just throw in the babies. They don't have to. They don't have antibiotics. No, nothing. It's crazy. So they, they take this marine phytoplankton, which is the lowest form of life on our planet. It's the plant form and within, within the ocean. It's everywhere. It grows. It's, it it poofs, poofs out oxygen into the atmosphere more than the Amazon jungle. Mm-hmm. And it is why you smell the ocean. When you go to the ocean, you go, oh, man, that air. It's the exhale of phytoplankton. So they get all this phytoplankton. There's a lot of it. It's little, tiny, 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 tiny. So and, they, and then they dry it out. And it's this green powder. And it tastes mm. like you couldn't, you can't imagine. Well, you can't imagine because you, you buy it. It's expensive. It's like, you know, a little tiny package. You buy it by the gram and you put little tiny bits of it. It goes a long, long way. I mix it with salt. Mm-hmm. So there's a salty ocean. So back, you bring the brine back into that. So you take oysters. Okay. Some oysters are naturally very salty. They're great. They're great. You know, usually more northern, colder water, saltier oysters, depending on the salinity of the ocean, because they're basically just parcels a flavor from the ocean and, and then you get to get them across the country, pop them open. Next thing you know, you can taste you're there. You know, it's the, it's marijuara, mm. you know, and they talk mm. about terroir and wine. So that being said, oysters grow where rivers enter into the ocean. So it's where salt water meets fresh water. It's brackish. That's, that's where oysters thrive. They like that. So you can get salt water oysters, you know, they're right. They're a little bit further down. They're more salty than, than fresh water. But you also get oysters that are up the river a little ways. And they're, they're more freshwater than salty. And they're boring. But they're not necessarily totally boring. They, they have a culinary uh, application. Like apalachicolas. They're not, not necessarily a salty oyster. They're from the Gulf of Mexico. Mexico mm-hmm. But they're fantastic for cooking. Because you can yeah. fry them. They got enough fat. You take an oyster from, you take a Melpec oyster and you fry that and you're, you're flossing your teeth with it. It just dries out. It doesn't yeah, know yeah. what to do. It doesn't have that fat content. So now if you get this, if you get oysters from uh, Chesapeake Bay, for instance, a lot of these oysters are up, they're more river oysters. And to me, you got Moonstones, great oyster, really great oyster, plump, great texture, good, good uh, flavor of the ocean, but no salinity. So it kind of goes flat. It's, it's a little boring, you know. It's what it's, it's a beginning oyster for those that never had an oyster, maybe. But I'm, I don't mean to be frowning. It's just like I want, I want vibrancy. I want my mouth to. to I mean, I'm paying three dollars for this thing, you know, for the snot mm. and a rock, as you know, Gaffney mm-hmm. calls them. So if I'm going <laughs> to slide that into my mouth, I want it. I want it to be a three dollar experience, you know. Mm. So 
You got the boring oyster. It's a little bit sleepier because it's in fresher water, but it's got all the other integrity, the great integrity of an oyster. You take some of this phytoplankton salt, sprinkle it on, and suck it in, and just enjoy the ride. It's, it's, it bro, takes you to another place, man. Bro, bro. It's, it, first of all, it makes you feel fantastic. Mm -hmm. And you feel like your lungs just open up. You just, it just feels good, you know? And, yeah, yeah. and I just want, you know, so all, all, all the, the work that you're doing, Rick, and <laughs> always preserving, you know, this, you, you have such a beautiful niche and such a beautiful heart and Thanks. what you stand for and everything. I mean, you know, you, you're, you're still here, man. You're doing it right. I'm, I'm so happy. And then thank you so much for having me, man. This is, yeah, this, this is amazing. This, this hour went really fast because I, I, I wish you were in my room. We could be hanging out and talking and you, we could be teaching each other. So, you know what I mean? I feel super, super blessed that we became friends, you know, real yeah. friends, you know what I mean? Because, yeah. uh, you know, we both, we always knew each other. We'd see each other. We'd say hello. It was always nice, nice these as you're, as you're, you're crossing, you know, ships crossing in the night at different events and places. But now I really consider you a true friend. Man. I would do anything no, and in the I, world for you. Man, I would do anything for you too, man. Look, we were in the heart of quarantine during the pandemic, man. This is what almost seven months ago now, yeah. and we we were in LA on lockdown. I was like, we gotta go somewhere and just get away. So me and my uncle, we we made that drive very safely, and we went to Rick, and we had uh, a day that was just memorable. Yeah, it was one of my one of my favorite days of my life. And we yeah. smoked and we ate, and we sang and we cried and we had a good. Right, man it was beautiful bro yeah i won't forget about it my buddy Me all, right? Man. all right all right you know um i just want to thank you and all everybody listening to our podcast today it's forever oceans huh? this is ocean rays i'm rick moonen this is my guest and i hate saying guest i'm my unbelievably dear friend aron sanchez who continues to support our industry and uh celebrate his latino um roots. Roots you know, and path, yeah. Yeah, man. You're making still sure to make, yeah, making sure that we're all good, man. Our industry is finally having to rebound. Make sure that you support your local restaurants. Yeah. Make sure you take care of our earth and our oceans, and we're gonna be all right. And go so, to Johnny Sanchez in, in New Orleans. Orleans. Go to New Orleans without a trip to Sun Johnny Sanchez. You blew it. All right, yeah. guys. Love you, brother. Right. Love you too. Be soon. Good. Take care, man. Bye. All right, brother. Bye. foreveroceans.com